From the UNC School of Journalism and Mass Communication, covering Carolina in HD, this is Carolina Week. Another year of Carolina Week has come to an end, and as is our practice tonight, we'll take a look back on those stories that made news this spring. We've covered everything from affirmative action to the student job market to bikes on campus and even virtual portals. And we'll be revisiting those stories again tonight. Good evening. I'm Sefe Amakpai. Welcome to this special edition of Carolina Week. And I'm Landon Dowdy. First up tonight, crime in Chapel Hill. It's always an issue. But what do we really know about it? Avery Harper reports probably more than you think. It was an ordinary day for UNC junior Anissa Jabbar. She was strolling to Panera on Franklin Street. Suddenly, a robber snatched her phone. I thought it was one of my friends. But it wasn't. The robber took off running, and Jabbar chased after him. And I yelled, can I please have my phone back? Give me back my phone. With the help of a few bystanders and the Chapel Hill police, Jabbar got her phone back. But she says the incident has left her uneasy. That's what I realized. I'm not the only victim here. According to Chapel Hill Police, it gets its largest volume of emergency calls from one area, downtown, including hotspot Franklin Street, frequented day and night by UNC students. In 2012, more than 200 crimes happened downtown. Most are classified as larceny. A study from Loyola University in Chicago and the Netherlands Institute says it's not dark areas or isolated walkways like this one that make robbers more likely to act. <laughs> But businesses like bars, restaurants, and hair salons that make Franklin Street the perfect target for potential robberies. They're going to target areas where they have more opportunity. Lieutenant Kevin Gunter says the kind of crime that occurs downtown is expected, given the kinds of businesses you'll find there. Gunter says Chapel Hill police are working to keep the downtown area safe. We're trying to, to put officers in areas where we are seeing more crime occur to try to deter that crime. And even though those officers helped Jabbar recover her cell phone and nab the robber who took it, she says she's much more careful when she walks along Franklin Street. Reporting in Chapel Hill, I'm Avery Harper. The United States Supreme Court is expected to rule later this year in two cases concerning affirmative action. The decision could end, end affirmative action in higher education as we know it. Reporter Kara Palmer showed us how this could affect diversity at UNC. Alexis Davis is a senior public relations student from Raleigh. When she's not studying, she serves as the president of UNC's Black Student Movement. Davis says affirmative action has made Carolina a better and more diverse institution. We have kind of led the way in you know, diversity action. We have our own diversity office, which is a very strong part of our university. And if we did not have affirmative action, then a lot of department things right here may not exist. But there are some who believe affirmative action hurts more than it helps. Greg Steele is chairman of the North Carolina Federation of College Republicans, and he's happy the Supreme Court is finally addressing the issue. I don't want people to get kind of trapped in boxes and, and thinking that, well, you know, we have to have a, a certain amount of whatever out to fit the requirements to come, and then let's, let's bring as many here as we can. Some think affirmative action results in unqualified students being accepted to UNC and elsewhere. Professor and former UNC Chancellor James Meeser says that isn't the case. What affirmative action does not do, it doesn't admit students who are not qualified and who, who can't be prepared and who won't succeed. Meeser is a strong proponent of affirmative action and says Carolina's diverse student body and faculty are a result of the policy. Currently, minorities are 26% of the student body, a 300% increase from 1978, when affirmative action began impacting enrollment numbers. Meeser says, though he's concerned about the pending court decision, he's not worried about the diversity of the UNC student body. We'll still have a diversified campus. We'll still do affirmative action. As for Davis, she remains hopeful. I, I, I sincerely do not hope that it changes affirmative action and hurts universities such as Carolina from being so diverse. No date has been set, but the Supreme Court can hear the case in the coming weeks. Reporting in Chapel Hill, I'm Kiara Palmer. February marked Black History Month, and to honor it, we ran a series of reports on prominent African Americans right here in Chapel Hill and around the state. And one, we took a look at a former mayor of Chapel Hill. Jonathan White introduced us to the first black mayor of a predominantly white southern town. Howard Lee was a North Carolina state senator, state cabinet member, and chairman of the state board of education. But that's not what he's most proud of. The one thing that I really want to be remembered for more than anything else is, is having been mayor of Chapel Hill. His journey to the mayorship began with buying a house. When he looked in white neighborhoods, realtors refused to even show him one. It was on that basis that I decided 
that the only way to bring about change was for me to jump into the political arena. But it took a newspaper article to push him over the edge, an article printed before Lee had even decided he would run. So when the headlines hit, I was as shocked as anybody else in town that it had come out. But uh, that's what flushed me out. Otherwise, I'm not sure that I would have, would have run. But he did, except nobody took his campaign seriously, not even himself. I frankly didn't have any idea that I could come anywhere close to winning the mayorship of Chapel Hill. But he did, and he became the first black mayor of a predominantly white southern town. After the election, a reporter asked Lee what he was going to do for the black citizens of Chapel Hill. His answer was surprising. And my response was nothing. I'm going to set priorities. I will not set priorities by ethnicity. I will set priorities by the needs of the community. And that's what he tried to do. Some would say he succeeded. You know the bus system? That's thanks to Howard Lee, the first black mayor of Chapel Hill. Russian adoptions were banned earlier this year. That after the Russian government took issue with a variety of U.S. positions. That's right, and I met one Durham family that wouldn't have been brought together if those rules had been put in place earlier. Carol Walker and her husband share this Durham home with their two kids. Hunter is 17, Brooks 14. Both were adopted from Russia. We were not able to have kids. We went through uh, in vitro, we went through several surgeries, all kinds of things that just wasn't happening. And we had sort of hit brick walls everywhere we turned. When asked what she thought of Russian President Putin's decision to sign a law banning Russian adoptions to the U.S., Walker had this to say. It just leaves a hole in your heart. And you, you can't help but think for these poor kids. Walker isn't the only one angry. More than 25,000 people gathered in Moscow to protest what they believe to be nothing more than retaliation from the Russian government to that of the United States. Here at Carolina Adoption Services, it's their job to match parents with children. So when a law bans them from doing just that, it's hard on everybody. Tanya Griazna is the coordinator of the Eastern European Division and has been working Russian adoptions for the past 15 years. Well, it's definitely left an impact financially and emotionally. It's a program that we've had had from the beginning of the agency. It has been a steadfast and reliable program. And at this time, basically, you know, we're not able to move forward. Although new adoptions are banned, the fate of adoptions already in the process when the law was passed is still unknown. 46 American families are stuck in limbo, just waiting to know if they can bring their child home. Right now, there's just a feeling of sadness for the families who are not going to be able to complete their, uh, you know, adoption. Walker says she's happy her wait was over a long time ago. And what have her children brought to her life? Um, everything. Lots of fun. Um, lots of excitement. Lots of activities. And lots of love. Bikes are a big part of getting around here on campus, but they can be dangerous, too. We have the story next. Connect with us online by liking the Carolina Week Facebook page and following us on Twitter at Carolina Week UNC. So I just moved in with this family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that! That's disgusting! Oh, poop already! You're making me nervous! Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. A boy born in Joplin, Missouri was fascinated by anything with wheels and a motor. The odds of him winning both the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 in the same year, one in 195 million. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, one in 88. I'm Jamie McMurray, and my niece has autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. You must be your fairy godmother. It doesn't take a fairy godmother to tell you that the right fit means everything especially when it comes to car seats. Always choose one that's the right fit for your child's age and size. Oh, that does make a difference. 
Remember, their happily ever afters are in your hands. To find out more, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. It's probably happened to you. You're walking around campus, minding your own business, when a whoosh, a bicycle whooshes right past you and it knocks you over. I know it's happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, one UNC sophomore wasn't so lucky. She found herself in the hospital with two broken bones requiring two surgeries. Reporter Alex Giles talked to her earlier this year. Katie Anderson is a sophomore biology major at UNC. She expects tough coursework. What she didn't expect was the bicyclist that struck her from behind. It was very terrifying just seeing all this blood dripping down my hair and face and my shoes. I had a lot of blood in my shoes and everything, so I just didn't. It, it was scary. I was very worried about it. The accident left Anderson hospitalized with a broken nose and a broken arm. She required two surgeries. It happened in front of Die Hall, begging the question, are campus cyclists a hazard? Walking bikes on campus is safe. DPS spokesperson Randy Young says the problem is that most students riding bikes through campus are in a hurry. Despite the risk, Young says the Department of Public Safety doesn't get a lot of complaints about bike traffic. If we receive a complaint, it's a priority for us. Uh, we act on any complaint. Um, I don't think for the campus it's, it's something that we see a lot of complaints from. I don't think folks uh, rush over here to complain. UNC student and bicyclist Quinn Carmine says sometimes pedestrians are the ones at fault. I've gotten very close but never hit anybody. What's annoying though is when people start like walking in front of you. I have like this entirely open bike lane and people just start inching over, inching over and then it, I, that's when it gets real close because I just got to squeeze right by them. Anderson disagrees. She says there's no need for a bike once you're on campus. There's a reason why there's bike racks like sitting right next to me in Die Hall, you know, because bike. I understand like biking to campus, but I don't think it's necessary to have to use your bike in the quad when there's so many pedestrians walking around. Anderson may be right, but right now there's nothing stopping bikers from whizzing by her on campus. In Chapel Hill, I'm Alex Giles. It's a long way from Chapel Hill to Hollywood, but some students are getting a little closer to the big screen thanks to a little known minor within the Communication Studies Department. John Daniels introduced us to the screenwriting minor here at UNC. Colin Hodges is a senior advertising major, but during his sophomore year, he enrolled in the writing for the screen and stage minor, also known as the screenwriting minor. I think it's great. I love it. I've loved every single class that we've taken in it. Um, the people you meet in there, it's just a, a room of creative people, and that's just awesome. This fall, the 10th class of screenwriting minors will be coming to Swain Hall. Director of the minor and professor Dana Cohen says he looks forward to bringing in the new class. I'm excited. The students seem generally more qualified as the years go on, as they become more and more aware of the program. Cohen says many graduates over the years have gone on to work for large-scale productions, like sci-fi's television series Haven. They all still want to be screenwriters, television writers, uh, etc. But um, they're, they've settled in very nicely, and I'm really very pleased. The classes in the minor have inspired Hodges to change his career plans. Since then, I just kind of, I've fallen in love with screenwriting, and that was sophomore year, and now, um, I'm actually going to go for it as a career. Cohen says he wants the minor to grow into a major one day. But I think the more uh, visibility the program has, the larger the footprint, the more um, attention we call to the program and the success of its students, I think the better chance we have of doing that. Until then, the minor will be preparing students for careers in screenwriting. In Chapel Hill, I'm John Daniels. Okay, admit it. You bring your laptop to class to supposedly take notes, but you find yourself checking Facebook, watching videos, things like that. Carolyn Chandler tells us all that's changing in some classes. Meredith Murchison is an international studies major and brings her laptop to class every day. She thinks it's an important tool for her to be successful. I always use my laptop in class because it's easier and quicker for me when I'm trying to listen to the teacher and take notes. 
but Murchison and other students might not have the option to use laptops in some classes. You discovered that the technology alone... Some professors are banning laptops in class because they believe they're a distraction. Dr. Kathy Packer banned laptops in her classes for the first time this past fall. I was really tired of talking to people who weren't paying attention. And I know they weren't paying attention because I'd be at a part of the lecture where I'd be talking about spring break or telling some bad story about bird watching or something that, you know, there was no reason to take notes. And I'd have people in the back of the room who were typing nonstop. And she may have a point. Professors who allow laptops in class may be unaware of what really does go on behind those screens. While some students do use them to take notes, others use them for Facebook, to check the news, a place to hide their cell phone, and even watch TV. Associate professor in the School of Education, Steve Notek, says laptops can be detrimental to learning if used incorrectly. Uh, we can only attend to one or two things at a time, and if you are attending to something else like what's going on on Facebook, uh, you can't do the hard work that's necessary for you to get the investment on your education dollar, basically. Despite laptops being a distraction for some, Murchison thinks banning laptops will hurt students that use them appropriately. Students will use the computer for the wrong reasons. They'll go on Facebook, they'll go on Twitter, but those students don't really want to learn anyway, so it's not fair to take it away from those who do want to learn and want to use it um, in a beneficial way. In Chapel Hill, I'm Carolyn Chandler. What does swimming have to do with eating disorders? We'll tell you coming up in our next segment. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 88. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. in the state senate becomes law, the number of college-aged voters might go down. It will require the student, students to register to vote in their home counties rather than where they go to school. If students were to decide to register where they go to school, like here in Orange County, their parents would not be able to claim them as deductions on their state taxes. Opponents say it's an effort to suppress younger Democratic voters. Jessica Marker has that story. UNC senior Wood Robinson likes to stay active in politics. I voted twice. I voted uh, once in the midterm elections and one in the most recent pre presidential election. During the midterm elections, he voted in Greensboro, where his parents live. Uh, but the problem with that was that I didn't feel like I knew anything about the local politics because I hadn't lived there for two years. A new bill introduced in the North Carolina Senate could make this a permanent problem for students like Robinson. I spoke with a sponsor of the bill, Senator Ronald Rabin, who said that students would have several options. Go home and vote. You can vote by absentee ballot, which in this state is very easy to accomplish. Or you can register to vote in uh, where your school is. He said the intent of the bill is to ensure that all citizens have an equal opportunity to be heard. I don't want to see my vote diluted. I don't want to see yours diluted or anyone else in the audience is diluted. But some senators in the legislature believe it would dilute the votes of populations that traditionally vote Democratic. I think it's a very blatant attempt to say that students who came out so strongly in 2012 and in 28, that they're going to say, well, that was a heavily Democratic vote and we are in charge as Republicans and we're going to make sure that those students don't vote again. The chairman of the North Carolina College Republicans says the bill is giving students the same rights as others living in temporary living arrangements. Uh, the model for this is how we treat uh, the military and how they vote. 
He says he would not support any suppression of voter rights. So I don't want anyone uh, feeling that, that their right to vote is, is being uh, you know, delayed or, or complicated in any way. Others disagree. It's just adding another measure of making it more difficult for people to vote, which is undemocratic and un-American. <laughs> College-age voters account for nearly one in five votes here in Orange County. In Chapel Hill, I'm Jessica Marker. Homecoming. It can be about more than just becoming campus royalty. It can be about service as well. Homecoming Queen Colleen Daly's service campaign is called Embody Carolina. Marilyn Payne caught up with her earlier this semester when the campaign was literally taking shape. Katie Barbie's in her last semester at UNC, and although she's involved on campus now, she feels she missed her junior year. Barbie says she spent all her time obsessed with eating and working out instead of being a part of Carolina's community. I started working out a lot more that summer and, you know, eating healthier, and it hadn't gotten out of control yet. Barbie says it took almost a year and a half for her to seek help. Finally, she was diagnosed with an eating disorder in September. Then she heard about Colleen Daly and Embody Carolina. So we wanted to pair um, the training and the training debut with an awareness component. And Miss UNC um, homecoming campaign presented a really beautiful opportunity for us. Daly is one of four co-founders who've been working with Dr. Cynthia Bulick and the UNC Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders on the program since last year. It creates a bridge between the student who's suffering from an eating disorder and the treatment programs. Embody aims to teach students to effectively help someone who shows signs of an eating disorder. Founders are also interviewing potential trainers, and those trainers called peer allies will begin work this month. Then, Embody's founders are confident they'll be able to start helping students like Katie Barbie live healthy lives, not obsessive ones. Reporting in Chapel Hill, I'm Marilyn Payne. An athlete's worst fear is getting injured, and for one athlete, that nightmare became a reality. Sports reporter Julian Caldwell will tell you about how a two-sport athlete got back on his feet next. And Tommy can't dance. So we're going to put some hands in their pants. Aww. The kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the super duper party troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants. They've got ants in their pants. They've got ants in their pants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. My name's Katie and I'm in the ninth grade. I'm an A average student and I'm an athlete working towards a scholarship. And everybody tells me how much potential I have. But I just wish someone would tell me where my next meal is coming from. Katie, how'd I do? Do you have to be so serious? Well, I mean, I did like a crazy dance in a movie if you want me to like, you know, do a little, no. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome back to this special edition of Carolina Week. I'm Julian Caldwell. A junior Roy Smith is a varsity athlete in two sports, but as I found out, it's almost a miracle that he can even play one. Here's his story. In the fall, he returns punts, and in the spring, he clears hurdles. But this might be junior Roy Smith's biggest accomplishment. But during the sixth grade, I really didn't think of none of those things. I was, basically, I really was thinking was, could I walk again? <laughs> A driver sped through a stop sign and hit Smith as he was walking to his grandmother's house. The, the car ran over me and it went like 50 feet and then he stopped and then I was laying there. The next thing I know I was in the hospital. I, kinda, I think I blacked out for a little minute. Smith suffered two major bone breaks in his lower left leg. 
His parents homeschooled him for a year and a half after the accident because he was embarrassed to go to school in a wheelchair or cast. I really didn't feel like running track after that no more. And um, they was like, you have so much talent, you need to keep on going. Smith continued to run track and play football in middle and high school. And he hasn't stopped clearing obstacles like he clears hurdles. After two years as a scholarship runner, in 2012, Smith tried out and made the football team. And listen to how he compares it to running track. Uh, football is nothing compared to track. Um, I can get through a football workout, but sometimes I can't get through all my track workouts. And after once losing the ability to walk, he strives to be great at both and to control his own destiny. I really don't want to be that athlete that's say, like, oh, he ran track and football. I want someone to say, that, oh, he did great in football and track, and he could choose whichever sport that he wants. And if anything gets in his way, he could probably jump right over it. And Sefe and Landon, as extraordinary as his story is, he doesn't even really like to talk about it a lot. Very humble. Very humble. What a remarkable story of perseverance. That was great. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Julian. Do you want to say hello to your friends or enemies at Duke? Well, now you can without even stepping into Blue Devil territory. We have the story next. If you have a story idea, call Carolina Week at 919-843-8292 or email us at carolinaweek at unc.edu. And if you have questions about this program, write to us at Carolina Week. Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. Be sure to check out Carolina Week online at carolinaweek.org. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. It's mm -hmm. totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you guys know statistically friendly kids have more friends? Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. A million places you'd never consider texting. So why would you do it while driving? Leave risky driving to the professionals. Stop the texts and together we can stop the wrecks. Well, the Tar Heel basketball team didn't beat Duke this year. But the next time they do, you don't need to storm Franklin Street to taunt the Dukies. Will Reimer shows us there's somewhere else you can go to get your message over to Durham. <laughs> Who needs to run all the way to Franklin Street when you can just go right here? This is a portal or virtual window connecting Duke and UNC. Cheering in the student union, you can taunt Duke students in the Bryan University Center. Two sophomores, one at Duke and one at UNC, thought of the idea. They say the portal isn't intended to divide the two campuses. It's something we're really excited about to see what kind of social connections we can make between Duke and UNC. Chris Batchelder, the other co-founder, says these social connections can join the two campuses. And having that virtual window that bridges the physical distance between Duke and UNC. Batch Elder says the portal is useful beyond just making new friends. Classes can gather in front of the portal, or he and Elder can make a smaller version for classrooms. The ease of access, just literally walking up to the virtual window and saying, hey, you know, get ready for class, and then everyone is, is all ready to talk through it. Elder says there are plans to reach out to other universities across the state and across the nation. But for now, the portal belongs to Tar Heels and Blue Devils. Although Duke and UNC are, are huge rivals in basketball and sports and maybe even other aspects of campus that we share a lot in common, um, and we just want the portal to be one more thing that Duke and UNC together can say is something that's ours. Ours, a word you won't hear too often tonight. Reporting in Durham and in Chapel Hill, I'm Will Reimer. Well, Sefe, we need some kind of portal like that to talk to all you seniors graduating. Aw, I <laughs> wish we had one too. Well, that does it for this edition and the spring 2013 semester of Carolina Week. Thanks for watching and th tuning in. We hope to see you again next fall. Good night. Bye.